am not ignorant to the history of the patriarchy and the structures that have been in place, right? But with that being said, again, even even Elon Musk today, he chimes in being like, you know, again, with the patriarchy over and over in this movie, we get it. You know, what is your take on it when it comes to pop culture and how they've been railing this home for years on the whole? It's it, Critical Drinker influenced a lot of this. So I'm going to, I'm going to shout That's him out. Okay. Again here, That's but okay. But we've seen this in the past 10 years or so. And this is thing because I love action movies. I've gotten to the point now where in, in my thirties where I'm like, I just love a good action movie. I also like really good female characters, but there's this trope of like the strong female character. Right. Uh, you can think about Ray in the Star Wars movies. You can look at what they tried to do with Indiana Jones and why that tanked. It's like a it's a female character who is better than right. They take the legacy character like Luke Skywalker, Indiana Jones. They're old, depressed. Their life is over with. And they're going to sub in somebody who's newer and better and a woman and diverse and this and that. Right. You have like these like it checks all the boxes. But they don't have to because they're such badasses. They don't have to go through the same struggles struggles that the origin that the original character came through with, right? So you have this 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 push for like the women don't deserve to go through any struggles to develop their character. They're just better because they're better. So true. When you think about that versus Ripley from the Alien movies or Sarah Connor from Terminator. If you think about Sarah Connor, and this may not be your thing, but Sarah Connor from Terminator One to Terminator Two: Judgment Day, which are two of the best action movies of all time, Sarah Connor was not prepared for what was going to happen, right? She's about to have the, her son is going to save the world from a AI robot dystopia, right? She doesn't know. She I mean, By the end of Terminator 2, she's like single hand pumping a pump action shotgun and fucking things up. Like she went from just a chick to a bad bitch in the series, in the in, throughout two movies. If you look at in a modern example of that, now when action movies, those movies are made for men, right? You're not going to have a lot of rom-coms with the main character being a strong dude, right? If you think about the holiday and these different movies, those movies are about those movies make a ton of money and they're made for women. Just like Extraction, for example, Extraction and Extraction 2 on Netflix, which I think this whole like Netflix going woke and going broke thing was so dumb. They made like a couple of shitty movies, but Netflix makes a lot of shitty stuff. Mm -hmm. They also made two of the best action movies of the last 10 years in Extraction and Extraction 2 with Chris Hemsworth. And those movies are fucking incredible action movies practical effects long action sequences kind of like john wick right? right and within that you have this the, the kind of secondary character and she is a bad bitch she's a diverse female co-lead in this movie she doesn't just like slap like accommodating stuntmen and have them get knocked out in one punch right she fights with with cunning and skill and badass firearms technique which she's clearly trained hard to to be able to do right nothing's given to her and she's not beating up 300 pound dudes by just being a bad bitch she like does it in so a way true. that she like pulls something on top of them or some, something creative yeah. in a way that a badass woman fighter who's a mercenary would beat somebody they're like bigger than them right and she's a dynamic character she loses things she's she's she go she has development of that character which the that that female character doesn't have generally in these other movies that have tanked you know and they and they play these culture war things like i was really annoyed with the little mermaid i was annoyed with the way they read it aladdin like these are movies that i loved growing up i dude the lion king came out when i was in the second grade i was in the prime for Lion King. Like we had a Lion King display in my second grade classroom that we all made. Like we watched it in class, you know, like it was, and then they did took that movie and like made it into something it wasn't. And it just, they, they cut all the darkness out of it and they try and do these different things where it's like, it just doesn't add up like this right. whole thing. And then they make these, they look back on their legacy characters like Ariel and um, Jasmine. And they're like, well, all they cared about their only motivation was a boy. And yep. I'm like, that's not at all what the case yeah. was. What Ariel wanted in in, in a Little Mermaid autonomy was, and was freedom and autonomy. Yeah. That's what she yeah. Now her, her she fell in love with somebody, but she wanted to be free of the ocean before she knew who Prince Eric was. Like actually, that all same thing with Aladdin because she uh, wants to be free out of the whole royalty trap of marriage. being caged in. Right, yeah. exactly. exactly. Yeah, and, that's and so Aladdin true. Was like a vehicle for that. And if you watch the movie, so she true. saved Aladdin's ass a bunch of times. Let's go back to The Lion King. Now, The Lion King was about Simba, but what was Simba doing? Simba was out fucking around with his friends because his dad died and he was all depressed and he was out here eating bugs with Timon and Pumbaa. And who came and fucking actually saved the day? Nala saved the day. Nala got helped him get his shit together and he came back because that's what women do. Women help you get your shit together and then put you on the path. 
And then because he had the, the physical capacity to be yep. a star, he goes and does the thing. But the, the, the linchpin in that whole entire story is Nala. Nala is the bad bitch. Nala put the whole pieces together. Nala is the fucking queen. And if you look at it through that lens, it's not like, oh, these are just secondary female characters that are only motivated by a man. It's like, no, she's motivated. She's doing what she needs to do to save her yeah. people, save her livelihood and save her family. Right. And he is so the, he true. needs to make that happen because that's what men do. Men go and fight and die and women put the pieces together. It's so you look at the whole thing and it's like those playing these archetypes yeah. and they've completely <laughs> lost, the, lost the fucking plot. And now I do like somebody like Timothy Chalamet, right. As in Dune, because that, that character in Dune, you know, is he is a young man, right. There's a, there's a role for that. But Timothy Chalamet is a childlike man. Like he's not, he could be, he's gonna be 30. He's gonna look like he's 22. He doesn't really, I, like Chris Hemsworth, for example, is the modern day Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? Like we yeah. need both of those things and Definitely. they have to play together. And when you look at that, you have to have this like dynamic where like yeah. you need a mercenary who go like a John Wick or a, um, or uh, Chris Hemsworth in extraction where it's like a bad motherfucker who has lost everything, right? And that's but th th always think about that too. When in an action movie, right? This is where the it's like, oh, it's so toxically masculine. John Wick lost everything, right? And then this motherfucker comes in and kills his dog that his wife sent him because she was dying of cancer, right? This has nothing left to lose, and he brings down a fucking gigantic organization over the course of four movies. If you look at Extraction, right? His he can't handle the fact that his child was dying of leukemia, and 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 loses everything loses his wife she leaves him because he can't be there while his kid is dying mm -hmm. this is a broken empty man who finds purpose purpose in saving other people's lives mm -hmm. that's that's the the underlying story of extraction right and generally he's saving kids in the whole movie it's like these aren't like i'm a, just a macho dude who likes to fuck people up that's not what this is and people that want to reduce it down to that are fucking retarded like yeah. it's just not that you have to look at like look at a story beyond what it's actually just putting on the face in the same way with Peter Pan like I talked about like growing up and these other there's right. big things in there so with that being said what is it's an interesting line because again I've been warning about this for years with this constant sort of male bashing causing men to feel confused and bad and insecure and in turn this shit show that we have today right but I also don't think the answer is in coddling and babying them. So it's a really weird kind of thing. It's seesaw right now because I don't agree with the hardcore, almost extreme feminists who are like eradicate men. We don't need men. And in turn, trying to make women like men. I am a fierce advocate and women and men are the yin and the yang we are different and we are powerful. We need each other. We work off of each other and trying to make one like the other has just begun. And again, I'm not saying we have to be in these, you know, archaic, you know, 1950s roles, right? Obviously we evolve and we, we grow, but there are fundamental things. I think that when we keep them intact, it works. Right. And, and we can empower and uplift the other in that. But with that being said, again, what do you, how do you see the line um, before we wrap? And we are going to get to the big bang of Andrew Tate in the end, but um, which I hope the big bang like goes over onto his house. But like, what is that line of getting the message through to men and also not babying and coddling them and enabling, right? All right. I'm going to try and answer that. Let me know if I'm answering the question. What I said, I said this on the show, because you kind of put this in my, in my ear the other day when we were talking, I think that a lot of these men, as far as being coddled are being told that, they're being, they're being told that victimhood, they're being sold manliness as victimhood, right? Like I think Andrew Tate's like, you're being oppressed. You're like, they, they get so mad about the oppression piece. And like you're being oppressed. Right. You're being villainized. This is unfair for you. You're a victim. Let me show you how to turn that victimhood into manliness. And I'm like, that those two things don't really go together, right? And even when you talk about on the other end of that, like the women that don't think men, like think men are the problem and men are this and that. You're like, well, men just need to get out of the way. Right, right. You a man telling somebody to get out of the way. If a man wants to fucking do something, they fucking do it. So if you want to take over, then fucking do it. But nobody's getting out of your fucking way. No man's like, this man needs to get out of my way. Nobody, no. You fucking, if you want it, fucking take it. That's that, and that's a different. There's a different perspective there, right? You got to like tap into that. That's what you want. And I think 
when it comes to the coddling piece on both sides, right? I think there's this, oh, oh, for men and women, like your character is developed through challenges. And generally men and women have trends and have, have traits that are going to be dominant, right? Women are generally more empathetic and more nurturing. That's evolutionary sure. biology. And exactly. Psychology. That's not, yep. that's not, that that is what it is. Because throughout history, men have had to do things that require you not to be very empathetic. It's not very empathetic to go to war, right? It's not, so there's true. not a lot of self-preservation in that, right? It's it's hard like to 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 end. If life. we're going back to cavemen, you're the hunters, you're the gatherers, you're the protectors, right? Even, even fucking ancient Rome. This isn't even now today. It's like it's yeah. not. Fun, you know what I mean? Like there's a yeah. part of that that has to be like you have to have the capacity. Even killing an elk is hard. Even killing a deer is hard. Like ending a life is challenging. I can't even imagine what it's like to have to like throw a grenade into a fucking building. You know what I'm saying. So it's like you look yeah. at that. Like there's there's but there's the. I understand that we want to move past where we've been as a, as a species over the past millennia, but you can't just for that doesn't just happen. And I do think and where Andrew and those guys get are onto something is like, it does seem like there's kind of a coordinated effort to, cause men are the ones, right. And this is what Andrew said in that interview with Tucker that I was like, Hmm, that's interesting. Men are the ones that generally will stand up to tyranny, right? Who, who defeated Hitler? Mostly Russian men. I thought about what he said. I thought about when he said that too, but you also have to put that in context of women not, historically speaking, being in roles of big platforms, power, big voices. So men naturally were in those roles to do that. If you think about the abolition of slavery, a lot of that was led by upper-class white women. Right. Again, they're very empathetic and they organized. Women are also very organized. They organized marches. Women's suffrage is a big part of this. Like women do it in a different way. Right. Women will do it in a much more like structured and organized way. They would they were not allowed to sit in these certain um hearings. They were only men were allowed to sit in these hearings for abolition of slavery. So they would put a curtain around a certain section and the women would sit in there. Like they they were fucking and, assertive with this right. like. We don't like, and then probably because of the women, the way the women were treated, the, the slave women were treated, like they stood up, like white upper class women right. were a big part of the abolition of slavery and like caused a shit show, which is literally how women, a lot of women get things done. I mean, women's suffrage and yep. abolition of slavery were a big part of that. So it's not like these women were just like docile home creatures that were just, they were out, they were speaking their fucking mind and they were making, they did it in groups oftentimes, whereas like, and then men. And their route, like they also fought fought these wars and put themselves in harm's way. It was a different way of doing it, but again, definitely. There's also, also and you probably roles. you probably see it in the household. I mean, there's something I always say this to be said about how women and men assert their ground and go into combat, so to speak. How women tend to be more like calculated, empathetic, everything you're talking about, where, where men will be like, let's take it outside, physical aggression, protecting their, taking their claim, ego, what have you, right? So there's something- well, being, a, being a dad has changed, like, yeah. it's locked up, like I've always had a, a capacity for violence. Like that's not been, you know, being in fights and doing whatever. And that's never been an issue for me. I mean, you know, whatever. Um, and growing up and like I said, in that small town kind of mentality where it's like, you kind of stand up for yourself and your friends. Like, I think I probably, I counted them out one time. I got like 12 different fist fights in college i think one of them maybe two had anything to do with me it was usually my <laughs> defending right jumped by some, like one of my friends got jumped by some guys and we went and fucking handled it you know what i mean it was one of those deals i remember i was standing next to my buddy at the bar and these guys had beat the shit my buddy had slept with somebody's girlfriend something stupid his own fault he got himself into something but he was my friend and there was like seven of them there was three of us and i was like dude you know we're about to get our asses beat right and he was like yeah and i go are we gonna do it anyway let's was, do it <laughs> Yeah. And I was like, all right. <laughs> so we get we're our- women, we're sitting back watching. We're like these clowns. Um, okay. <laughs> quick while we wrap, quick hot take uh before we get into the big bang. Um, is uh, did you watch Entourage? Yes. Okay. I love Entourage. And again, you watch it now, and some of the things just wouldn't again, this is coming from me, who is the most I am not a victim, step into my power woman. Like some of the things it's like, oh, that just, that just, it's a little different today, right? The way that they talk about women and all this and that. And Entourage now, it's constantly defending itself because people now call it so misogynistic and sexist. And I can appreciate men, you know, 
checking out women and and men's like it, it's the 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 kind of underbelly of how women men's lives almost like revolve around women like that's a hot girl I gotta get her I gotta get her right like that whole thing um which is fine but people will take it out of context and say it's objectifying and you know how they talk about women like a piece of meat so is entourage quick hot take sexist misogynistic all these things or is it just guys being guys or where does that become problematic i think that they're uh, when i think about it's been a long time since i've seen entourage but i did watch it all i think the people who mostly did that i think it was mostly drama and turtle right am i wrong i mean it's all of them it's a lot of like getting with women they talk about getting you know happy endings for five ten bucks you know all these things constantly trying to get women like i get that one you get that one right and again where's the line of like that's guys being guys and it's an uncomfortable truth and also like where it's respectful right well i think one i think it's disrespectful i think it's childish for sure it's also real like if you go to la if you spend around time around la guys exactly about la guys Right. And honestly, let's look at sex in the city. How different are they? Really? I mean, I argue that women don't do it. We objectify men, but it's not the same. Like, it's just not. We see it. It's like, okay, cool. There's Ryan Reynolds shirtless hot. Whereas dudes go goo goo gaga, like tits, ass, me not able to speak. Right. And sex in the city. Is that the, that's the older one, right? Samantha is the set. Yeah. He objectifies men pretty aggressively no totally totally it's just not as <laughs> pervasive it's not equal and and listen it's not, it's not. but I, it's, it's like it's that's a show made for women who kind of just ca- their characters of the locker room talk the dumb bullshit you know what yep, i mean like, yeah yep. it's a it's a it's a it's a hyper character like and yeah young boys do act like that i've been in locker rooms a lot of them you know what i mean i've showered with a lot of guys yeah. i don't know what's up that's but also like if a guy was talking to me like that now in my third like it, the, in, when you're 22 that's one thing right so that, true when i watched so Entourage, i was like 20 21 yeah. 22 when it first came out no one talks like that now no no grown-up who actually gets with women is so like, but in college true. it was like, like that you are no, not we cool stupid we were, and, and girls were the same way it was like we were children we're we're done we're coming into our own but you grow out of that shit and like the idea that that's like so if you're doing that now and you're doing that around like men, they're like, okay, what? Like, like if I if, if I was around somebody who was like, yeah, dude, I fucked that bitch, I'd be like, oh, okay. you're a loser, get a life. Like, <laughs> no, a hundred. And I do think that there is not to go down this path, but it's okay. You know, the biological instinct, this is where it's different, where men are biologically programmed to fuck things. Like, there's a great Ali Wong bit in her new. Uh, stand up that I'm obsessed with, where it's like anything with a hole will do, right? And like men come in five seconds, whereas women, it's like, how can I come at a time like this when this is all going on in the world and this and that? Like, what is more truer than that, right? But that instinct in men to spread their seed and and with as, as many women as possible, this goes way, way, way back. Whereas women, right? We are the nurturers. We are, you know, it's different. And the thing is, that's okay. But it's like navigating it into the modern world where you're not a Neanderthal. I think about. <laughs> I think about the one when I think about it, I'm like the one that was the most misogynistic in the whole thing was drama, who was also the most insecure and got the least chicks. If you think about it, right? It's like Eric was the thing is, Connor, and this is where the creators of Entourage will argue. And I talk about this with Andrew Tate, right? The word misogyny is thrown around so much. And with Entourage, they'll argue. These guys, are they immature and childish? Yes, but they love women. They don't think of women as less than. Their whole thing is like chasing around and trying to get a woman to to get with them because they love women. Whereas yeah. with an Andrew Tate, it's like you generally have a you you it's, you generally have a disdain for I, women. I've been in a situation where I've been dating multiple women at, at at the same time. They knew about each other. Like it was I was just casually dating, right? And I was having a lot of sex and doing a lot of different things. But I wasn't exploiting anybody. I wasn't manipulating anybody. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Just, like, this is all this is where we're, I was in California. And honestly, a guy like me in California is pretty fucking rare. So I was in a pretty decent rate mating market because I'm a relatively masculine dude who came from Texas, who kind of talks like somebody from Texas, who doesn't, you know, who doesn't walk around in flowy gowns. Like that's that's so it was it was great. It was really fun. But I wasn't exploiting somebody. And I think that's where the exploitation and manipulation are really gross and dark and should be avoided. And you got to be able to really see that. Really good point. And where Andrew comes in, it's like he, I think he literally was exploiting women. Yeah. Do, 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 do I know for a fact that what he was doing was illegal and that he was trafficking people? I don't know. It seems like the charges are a little bit weird and with the way they're going about it. Yeah. I don't, 
but I don't, again, I don't pay that much attention to the guy because I don't have a lot of respect for him, and he doesn't really inspire. Like to me, it would just be reactionary. To it would be it would be antithetical to masculinity for me to give a fuck about Andrew Tate for me, right? Right. Would yeah, be, I love would, that. Would be, I would be at odds with my own masculinity. To be I like, love. Oh, wow, that. I'm like mad about this guy, or I'm like in supportive of this guy. I'm like I I'm in, I'm the opposite of hate isn't love. It's indifference, and I am generally indifferent to Andrew Tate. I love now, that. That's what we said, need. And, and his, his his son said this, like, doesn't matter if you're a good, or his brother said this, if it doesn't matter if you're a good dad or whatever, because I can still, like, get your girl to do whatever on a webcam. I'm like, listen, motherfucker. And this is the one thing that dads need to know. The best way to keep your daughter from being exploited by fucking toxic people like that is to be scary as fuck. And if Period. somebody, my daughter, it's like, and it's not like this, like, I haven't had this conversation with my dad, because, like, when you have a, I have a little girl, I'm like, the pedophilia thing, this is going to get dark, so hold on, I'm like, if someone were to sexually abuse my child, there would not be a trial. There would not be an arrest. There would be a dead motherfucker. Like I respect it. that. This is a like, less dark version of that, but I had a boyfriend in high school and he was not respectful. He would drive me home at like one in the morning past curfew with the music blasting. And my dad would literally come out with a baseball bat and I, is like, are you sure about the fuck? And again, my dad is the most like compassionate, caring man, but- <laughs> Are you sure you want to do that? And that's like, don't know. Dis dis disrespectful boyfriends are different than pedophiles. <laughs> yes, that's what I said. It's a much, it's a much, it's a much lighter note. But okay, I have to wrap, Connor. But this is a perfect thing into my last thought here. And also, I have been meaning, I know I teased the whole idea of the yin and the yang of the powerful woman being a submissive. And this is something I've teased at before and I'd love to get into later at another time. So everybody be on the little edge of that. Like paying her edge of your seat for that because that's something in my personal life that I've explored and have loved. But love to you about that. Yeah, it's it is the best. It is so empowering and freeing because I think it's like allows women to tap into another, oddly enough, like in submitting, tapping into consensually, Andrew Tate, you asshole, uh, to a to an oddly enough, like another dimension of themselves and part part of their power and allows them to be like more you know, uh, empowered in real life, but I will say this with Andrew Tate, right? So I have been a really fierce defender of men mm -hmm. because, you know, of all this, right. I want them to feel empowered and be good guys. And I've heard a lot of female friends of mine who are public figures talk over and over <clears throat> about misogynistic dudes uh, and disrespectful dudes on social media. And I always said, I I have to say, the guys who listen to my show uh, cheer me on, are respectable dudes, aren't pussies, and, and are, are the standard of what men should be, right? Having their back. And I have to tell you, the first time that I experienced this kind of disrespectful, disgusting language over and over and over is when I spoke out against Andrew Tate. Oh, yeah. And I saw what they meant. I was like, this is what it is. And the sad part to me is you will have his, I mean, they worship him. And so with his, even if it's undertones of degrading women, they will take all of that in, in the message. And that's what scares me. And they will defend it. And they will literally say, look, he's not perfect. They'll look the other way. And they'll say, he's not the hero we necessarily want, but he's the hero we need. And this is what scares me because they will stop at nothing. They will see nothing else. So last kind of thoughts as we wrap, why is this a, a house of worship for people? Why are a hundred million people watching him on, you know, with Tucker Carlson? Why are people, you know, feeling so seen by this? And secondly, what does it take? How do we get out of it? And how do we restore that? <clears throat> so I think the reason that so many people are watching it is a different answer. I think that's because of the outrage, right? It's a Streisand effect. Like people are like, don't watch this. So watch it. Right. I think that's where that's going. I think the same thing's happening with something like RFK's campaign, who I'm a big supporter of. Like, it's like, don't look at this. It's dangerous. And we're like, uh, I'm going to look at it. <laughs> but I think the reason that one, he's, right, it makes you want to more. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So with him, I think that he's one, his, like I said, his descriptions of what's going on, are accurate. So there's a there's a nugget of truth in his message, right? His his underlying premise is correct. His prescriptions for what to do about it, I feel like are really fucked up and really damaging to and I do I by saying like it's 
I don't want to use like the super fucking woke language of like it's problematic and all that kind of stuff, but it's not good. It's not helpful for men, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. It leads them down a, a, a dark path that I think it's going to take a lot of work to get out of. I think the reason that it is so appealing to men is one, there's a, a lot of men are insecure. Um, they're not getting laid. Girls don't like them. They're afraid, right? And there are so few paths that aren't villainized. Jordan Peterson was a healthy path for a lot of men in that mm -hmm. place. And he was villainized. And that's what we, when you do, when you turn Jordan Peterson, a university professor who's speaking articulately and, and in a well thought out way about the issues that are, that men are going through. And you turn that guy into Darth Vader, you get a real Darth Vader, you get Andrew Tate. So he is the manifestation of what people would call the left. He's their worst nightmare. And he, he, Jordan Peterson, as much as he tries now, didn't have the same asshole appeal. Fuck you as Andrew Tate does. And that's what that, all those people want is the pe all those boys that 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 follow him and worship him want is for someone to tell the people that have been telling them that they're bad for existing right. to go fuck themselves. It's the same thing as Trump. It's the same deal. It's the and it, it it's 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 not. I wouldn't say it's it's the fault of any particular, but it is the equal and opposite response to all the shame still on the other side. They're mirror images of each other. They're mirror extremes of one another. And since there aren't very many productive, healthy routes for men to go. They're gonna they're gonna gravitate towards that, right? And that that that's because everybody who spoke to men was turned into a villain. And when that's the case, when it's like and it's the same thing, it's like calling marijuana a gateway drug. When you when you think when you put marijuana in the same category as heroin, right? You make it a gateway drug because like, well, I've already done marijuana, I might as well do coke. I might as well do heroin, right? You put them all in the same category, which is what the right did back in the day, right? You said, well. Jordan Peterson is is the worst thing that's ever happened. He's evil. Okay, well then here's here's real now when you say it about Andrew Tate, nobody fucking believes you. You've cried wolf already, right? No one's gonna buy your bullshit, right? And that's we're we're there. So it's like the the people that are criticizing him have lost all credibility because they've made zero fucking sense over the past ten years. So they're valid criticisms oftentimes, and even their bad faith attacks all just go unheard because we've heard the same shit. RFK is uh is anti-Semitic. Right. Um, Trump is a fascist. Jordan Peterson is a misogynistic, uh, racist, yeah. uh, transphobe. So, so it's like all this is like you've you it's a, the best way to say is like the people that have criticized him have cried wolf. And even when you have good faith critiques like you do, it, it gets it gets heard from the same place. Exactly. And, so and that's that prophet Barbie, that's what I was worried about all these years. It's like, you can't even hear anything else. And I will say with this, you know, before you get into the remedy for this is I will say there are women like myself from all sides of the aisle who have spoken up and who I've said some version of what I've said about Andrew Tate. And this is what's crazy for me. We're not woke, nonsensical, outraged people. Like I'm the first person in theory in line with these people who worship Andrew Tate in the, in terms of like the media blow, you know, having their false narratives and making you want to think a certain thing. Like I'm the first person to call that shit out, but like, you would think these guys would listen to all of these hot women who aren't woke nonsense viewers saying the same thing. Like, yeah. do you, or do you not want to get laid? Do you, or do you not want to get respected? It's like, you're willing right. to listen to Andrew Tate over all of us. No offense. Like, right. Yeah. <clears throat> How do we remedy it? So I think, damn, there's a lot that has to happen. I think within a, a man's personal life, like I think it's really important for men, if I was just giving advice, to really understand their principles. I think that's a that's an aspect of masculinity. Like for me, it's curiosity, resilience, and passion. I think you need things in your life that you're passionate enough about that you want to show up to those things as your best self. Now, of course, it's family and other things, but for me, that's golf, that's hunting, right? Like I have to, that's that's my own thing, and I want to show up on September first for elk season, as ready as I could possibly be, right? Which is why this injury I was going through, like with my shoulder being all messed up, I'm like having a panic attack about it. So I'm like, I that's just around the corner, that's a month away. We need those, and I think developing resilience as a man means a lot of things to a lot of people. Maybe that's financial resilience. Maybe that's being able to do things for yourself, get your hands in the dirt, being able to like solve problems for yourself, uh, physical, mental, emotional resilience. That's what I would say the prescription is for a specific dude, right? 
And then curiosity is like finding those things, right? You just got to be out there and like be open-minded to different ideas and different experiences. Mm-hmm. And I think this also helps a lot with dating and shit like that as well. Cause having a partner and having feeling like you're making progress as a man is really important. I think we have to really have the people that are these, these people that are creating bad faith attacks culturally on the bigger, on the larger scale, culturally here, the people that, that are having these, or, or generate these bad faith attacks on these type of people that are speaking to men specifically have to be called out from their own side. Right. Like you have, you have conservative people calling out Andrew Tate, which I think is helpful on the other side of the cultural aisle. You have to have people calling that out on that side. You have to have so somebody, true. you have to have somebody on, you know, somebody, some hack on MSNBC being like, Hey, the way you're characterizing this is makes no fucking sense. Right, which they won't or the do. the Barbie movie to make fun. I thought it was going to do that. I gave it that much benefit of the doubt. I was like, maybe it's going to make fun of how hard pop culture and woke people have gone. But right. they played right into it, right? right. Kind of like a South Park type of thing where they kind of pick yeah. up all, all sides from every yeah. angle. That's yep. really helpful. You know what I mean? And there's yep. some other shows that do that as well. So I think you, you kind of need that on a cultural level. Um, and this is where people like Crystal Ball kind of annoy me because i'm like you just don't speak up against that kind of shit enough assertively enough uh because they have a platform they have a voice for it and somebody like joe rogan is now doesn't have even though he is like a he's on the left like i'm on the left kind of yeah. he doesn't get seen that way i don't get seen that way i don't have the audience to do it anyways and i think for men they have to really ask themselves like am i being sold victimhood disguised as masculinity that's the number one. Are you being sold victimhood as disguised as masculinity? If you see that, if you can, if you can look at it through that lens and it's not about like, Hey man, you're wrong. You're being conned. You're a fucking idiot. N- none of that shit. Right. It's not like about blame or judgment, but you have to be able to have these people be like, Hey man, I get why you aspire to be like this guy. Cause this guy is kind of above all the bullshit that you have to deal with on a daily basis. But are you just being sold victimhood disguised as masculinity? That, that question by itself, I think it'd be really productive. Mic drop. Love it. End it on there, Connor. Thank you so much. This bitch is going to be a two-parter. Oh, wow. And uh, I appreciate you and your input. It's so thoughtful. And keep doing the uh, the good work of, of dad life. Good luck with that. Doing it for the, for the rest of these fools and being a good role model for you know the people around you and us and your daughter and all that that's what we need it's the every every guy you know thanks so I'll much the every guy but you know what i mean yeah. I, I, I try i i more and more am every day i think i'm gonna go get my daughter right. a kid and go to the bow shop and get myself all dialed in and uh hopefully i'll be putting a, a hole in an antelope in about i got 20 days i can't this got here so fast having a kid makes the year go by so fast man, oh man also well, have kids everybody they're the best. Yeah, I can't wait. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And, you know, I'm going to have you go back to being a caring, compassionate dad and then go shoot stuff. There you go. Men, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so thank much. Thank you Taylor. so much. I'm sorry I went a little bit over. It's okay. I got plenty of time.